بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم اللهم افتح لنا فتوح الآرفين ووافقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا بالقرآن والذكر الحكيم اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا بما ينفعنا وزدنا علما يكلمنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الهزن إذا شئت سهلا سهلا اللهم عذنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستغفر ونصوم إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم قال الإمام حجة الإسلام الغزالي رحمه الله ونفعنا به وبكم أما تسمع قوله تعالى لسيد المرسلين صلى الله عليه وسلم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولقد آتيناك سبعا من المثاني والقرآن العظيم لا تبدن عينيك إلى ما متعنا به أزواجا منهم We finished last time on this ayah where, the, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم We have given you the seven Paired ones and the great Quran. The seven paired ones are the Fatiha. <coughs> so, by consensus, the ayahs of Fatiha are seven from the Sayyaf Quran. The ikhtilaf is whether the Bismillah is the first ayah or whether Alhamdulillah is the first ayah, but everyone agrees there are seven ayahs in Fatiha. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Do not extend your eyes to that which we have given certain couples amongst them Certain couples meaning People that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given many children, for example, or many sons. The Prophet ﷺ didn't have any son which survived past infancy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, don't look at these people. Allah's given them that blessing. And it's a test for them. You know, so it's, it's a reminder to us that the Prophet ﷺ was given something much greater. He was given the Fatiha. He was given the Quran, the revelation. So just, you know, just remind us that even the Prophet ﷺ was given this message from the Quran. So how about us? We have to keep reminding ourselves of the great blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, the blessing of Islam, the blessing of the Quran. You know, when we feel desirous towards worldly things, you know, and the most desirous things are those Things like having sons, for example. As is mentioned in the Quran, Zuhina Lina si Hubbu Shahwati Minan Nisa wal Banin. First of all, from women, for a man, the most desirous thing in the world, in this world, from the world, is a woman. The ayah, ayah mentioned the things in order of desirousness. The second is Banin, sons and daughters. The third then, huge treasures, wealth, in other words, etc. So this is just reminding us that these are simply the worldly pleasures, don't forget these. So, when we come on to the seventh stage, inshallah ta'ala may Allah make us give us all tawfiq to come to the seventh stage that Imam al-Ghazali describes of purification. When we come to the seventh stage, these are the type of things that we have to keep in mind, shukr. Always remembering the blessing that Allah has given us to bring us to that stage. To make us Muslim, to make us mu'min, to make us, give us tawfiq to purify ourselves. So inshallah, for the last few pages of the book, I will be summarizing 
uh, because we're going to finish the book today, inshallah ta'ala, as according to our niya. So uh, I'll summarize a few of the pages and then read the last couple of pages for the barakah for, for the word to word of Imam al-Ghazali. So Imam al-Ghazali then goes on to speak in the following paragraph <coughs> reminding us that the pleasures of this world are given to every kafir, to every fir'aun, to every mulhid, to every zindiq, to every jahil, to every fasiq. The pleasures of this world are given to them. How can we become deceived that the pleasures of this world are something that are praiseworthy? And so he's reminding us that in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of the pleasures of this world are nothing more than the wing of an insect. And the pleasures of this world are the lowest type of pleasures because they are temporary. Anything that is temporary is always the lowest thing. Anything that's going to fade and vanish away is always uh, one of the worst things because in reality it doesn't exist. It's here for a moment and it's gone. Yeah? So what sort of thing is that? The true pleasure is the one that lasts forever. So Imam Ghazali reminding us, look how Allah given all of these worldly pleasures to the kafir, to the fir'aun, to the mulhid. And many of the prophets and the awliya and the siddiqs and the alims and the abids, they don't have these worldly pleasures. You know, you see them living very simply, not having much of these worldly pleasures. So what does that show us? It reminds us these worldly things are not something to, to fight over, to run after, etc. You know, and he mentions one saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Musa and Harun. If I wished, I could have sent you to Fir'aun decked out in such a fashion, with such riches and wealth, that it would have bedazzled him, you know, when he had seen it. And he would have known that this is something that even he cannot achieve. If Allah wished, he could have sent Musa and Fir'aun like that. You know? But I wish to keep those worldly uh, riches away from you both. And that is how I deal with the people that are close to me. <clears throat> and then he mentions from the Quran an ayah of similar meaning. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْلَا أَنْ يَكُونَ النَّاسُ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا لَجَعَلْنَا لِمَنْ يَكْفُرُ بِالرَّحْمَانِ لِبُيُوتِهِمْ سُقُفَ مِنْ فِضَّةً So, really beautiful ayah from Surah Al-Zukhruf. For people who have read it would have probably noticed it. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, just follow, you know, I think Omar, you asked me about this one yeah. a few years, couple of years back, this ayah. Allah says, if it were not that all people would have become one Ummah, He would have given those who disbelieve in Allah houses made of silver or roofs made of silver. And then the ayah goes on actually to say staircases made of silver as well. What's the meaning of that? In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give these, the kuffar, people who disbelieve in him, their whole houses made of silver. In other words, he would have given them so much riches in this world. Why? Because it's temporary. It's worthless at the end of the day. But the re he, Allah says, if he had done that, all people would have become kuffar. 
no one would have believed in it. When they had seen the huge riches given to the kuffar, they would have left the deen. So this is shows the nature of the human being. And this is what Imam Ghazali is saying in the passage previously, that actually when Allah withholds the worldly pleasures, it can be a sign that He is guiding that person, that He is favoring that person. Because the worldly riches can lead to all sorts of tribulations. So that's the meaning of the ayah. That these world these worldly riches are so insignificant that Allah would have given the disbelievers whole houses made of silver and gold. Were it not, and then all human beings would have gone astray if that had happened. Um, so, okay, I think my, my daughter's on that. Is she? Is she? She has a Okay, so this is just, you know, once again, reminding of the shukr that we need to give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Imam al-Ghazali says, no, that it's not possible for me to give the full explanation of why we should be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not possible for me to give the full explanation of how much blessings He's given us, otherwise I would have to fill a thousand, thousand pages, he says. He says, أَمَا تَسْمَعُ وَيْحَكْ قَوْلَهُ تَعَالَى لِسَيِّدِ الْمُرْسَلِينَ صلى الله عليه وسلم مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلَا الْإِمَانِ He says, look at, have you not seen what's written in the Quran? How, the, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the best of all messengers, مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا, ما الْكِتَابُ You didn't know what was a book. You didn't know what was Iman. You know, even showing that this was a blessing on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi to be given Iman, to be given the book. You know, reminding us, imagine if this is a blessing for the Prophet how much is a blessing for us? Allah taught you what you did not know. And the bounty of Allah was huge upon you. you know, this is upon the Prophet how about us? How grateful we should be for this blessing. Allah has given Yamunu alaykum. Allah has given you all these favors that He has guided you to Islam, to Iman. In other words, this was addressing to the Bedouin Arabs who were trying to say that they had done a great favor by becoming Muslims. Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, No. Don't say that you've done a favor by becoming Muslim. Allah has given you a great favor for guiding you to Iman. So this is the type of thing that he's talking about. كان سفيان رحمه الله تعالى يقول ما أمن أحد على دينه إلا سلبا سفيان سفيان بن عيينة رحمه الله يسوع say no one feels secure in their deen except that it is taken away from them in other words they stop having shukr and they start feeling secure that this is something I am now a mu'min I am a believer Allahu Akbar so they start feeling secure in their own iman they stop having shukr for tawfiq from Allah, then it will be taken away from them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. Can a shaykh on a rahmullah yaqul, he says our shaykh used to say, إِذَا سَمَعْتَ بِحَالِ الْكُفَارِ وَخُلُودِهِمْ فِي النَّارِ فَلَا تَأْمَنْ عَلَى نَفْسِكِ When you hear about the state of the disbelievers and their being for eternity in the hellfire, do not feel safe for yourself. 
فَإِنَّ الْأَمْرَ عَلَى الْخَطَرِ This affair is surely dangerous. وَلَا تَدْرِي مَاذَا يَكُونُ مِنَ الْعَاقِبَةِ You don't know what's going to happen in the end of the affairs. وَمَاذَا سَبَقَ لَكَ فِي حُكْمِ الْغَيْبِ You don't know what has already been decreed against you or for you. What has been written, how you will die upon iman or upon kufr. None of us knows what was written for us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who are written to die upon iman. فَلَا تَغْتَرُوا بِسَفَاوَةِ الْأَوْقَاتِ Don't start becoming deceived because you're living these pure days of iman and ibadah. فَإِنَّ تَحْتَهَا غَوَامِدَ الْأَفَاتِ Underneath this purity, this purity that you're feeling when you're doing your ibadat and you're living as a mu'min, there are a lot of dangerous uh, pitfalls that the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are aware of. That's why they're always in a state of tawbah and shukr. Because they know how easily any of us can go. وَقَالَ بَعْضُهُمْ يَا مَعْشَرَ الْمُخْتَرِّينَ بِالْعَسَمْ إِنَّا تَحْتَهَا أَنْوَاعُ النِّقَمْ زَيَّنَ اللَّهُ إِبْلِيسَ بِعْنْوَاعِ إِسْمَتِهِ And one of the scholars said, Oh, you people who are deceived by being in this state of uh, protection and purity, just beneath you there is a lot of dangers, all sorts of dangers, just hovering around you. Look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had embellished Iblis with all sorts of protection and all sorts of, as if he was a pious person, a pious jinn, as if he was one of the top of the balaika, you know, to those who were watching, that's how it seemed. But obviously in the, in the qadr of Allah, in the knowledge of Allah, Iblis was the lowest of the low, even at that time. When he was the highest of the high. So how do any of us know where we are in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And also Bal'am, this person, this person who was a pious man but then was fallen down to the lowest level. But in the, in the eyes of Allah, it was known who he was. وَعَنْ عَلِي رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ كَمْ مِنْ مُسْتَدْرَجٍ مِنْ إِحْسَانِ إِلَيْهِ وَكَمْ مِنْ مَفْتُونٍ بِحُسْنِ الْقَوْلِ فِيهِ وَكَمْ مِنْ مَغْرُورٍ بِالسَّطْرِ عَلِيهِ Ali radiallahu anhu said, How many people are deceived, mustadraj, led astray because of the sort of what they could think are blessings coming to them. When the worldly pleasures and things are open for them and they become deceived thinking that they're on the right path. How many people are muftoon bi husnil qawlifi? How many people are, are under tribulation because of other people saying good things about them? And this leads to them falling into riya or ujub or takabbur or all these things. And how many people are deceived by the satar upon them, by being veiled? In yeah, the true state being veiled, they think they're in a state of iman and ibad and all these things. But who knows what Allah has written for them before the end of their life? You know, I mean, I met, I met, the, there was people, I met Muslims in Syria that had gone to study. They were converts, they became Muslim, they went to study in Syria. They were with Shayyukh, sitting with Shayyukh for years. They went to Morocco. And after many years of being in that environment and in that Iman, they, and there were people actually, they were giving, they were actually debating with other non-Muslims. And when new Muslims would come, they would be shown to guide them and talk to them. And then these people left Islam at the end of all that time. May Allah protect us. So we can't feel safe. This is a very dangerous place we're in. And then he mentions that I have Quran سَنَسْتَدْرِجُهُمْ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we will gradually take them more and more astray in ways that they cannot perceive. So this is when Allah gives apparently karamat to someone, apparently favors to someone, but in reality leading him more and more astray.
He mentions, look, look at, you know, Ibrahim al-Khalil. This is what Shaykh uh, Akram Nadvi mentioned when he done a talk here a couple of years back. Look at the Quran. What's the concern of the prophets? Ibrahim alayhi salam, what does he say to his children? What does he say to his people? wa baniya and na'bud al asnam He says to his people, just leave us and leave me and my children that we don't. Uh, we don't worship idols. And what does Yusuf say in his dua? Tawaffani Muslim and oh Allah, make me die a Muslim. This is the concern that the prophets have. What's the last thing that Yaqub says to his children before he dies? Am kuntum shuhada if hadara Yaqub al maut. Were you present? Were you witnesses when death came to Yaqub? Is qala li manihi. What does he say to his children at the time of death? What will you worship after me? What will you worship after me? That's his concern. They said, We will worship your Lord and the Lord of your fathers, Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq. Ilaha Wahid and the one God. So, going on to the next section. Um, uh, we'll go to the next section, inshallah. If we would do a tadadu, 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 ila Allahi ta'ala. Talking about the necessity of being humble in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, you know, just once again to summarize, he says, if you think and reflect carefully upon the favors and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you, uh, and all of the favors and blessings and, and help he gives you. Something that you cannot even imagine, you know. What your imagination cannot even conceive of. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has helped you to go through these different stages that we've mentioned. These aqabat, these seven stages. And you get to the stage when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened up to you the knowledge of this deen and the spiritual insights and you have purified yourself from being in a state of sinfulness and disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you have gone through the four stages of fighting against the shaitan and the nafs and the desires and the bad company you've gone through the other stages of going through relying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not becoming preoccupied by the worldly rizq etc You've gone through the stages of Riyah and Ujub. Once you've gone through all of this and Allah has given you Tawfiq and Hidayah, yeah, and you have reflected deeply upon this Tawfiq that has been given to you, then you go into a state of Shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You occupy your tongue with praising him and thanking him. You know, with, with dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You fill up your heart with the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So much so that nothing can come between you and obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the tawfiq to worship him and obey him and so you stay upon this state always remembering that you are deficient in whatever you're doing to fulfill the blessings that he's given you and anytime you fall into any forgetfulness or heedlessness you turn back to Thanking and praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So your dua at this stage is to be Ya Allah Ya Mawlaya Kama Badatta bil Ihsan Bifadlika Min Ghayri Istihqaq Fa Atmimhu Bifadlika Aynan Min Ghayri Istihqaq So the dua at this stage should be Oh Allah Just as you gave me hidayah, you gave me, brought me to Islam without me deserving it or earning it in any way 
then please, O oh Allah, fulfill and complete your blessing upon me by keeping me upon this path without me deserving or uh, having any istihqar, I mean, deserving it in any way. وَتُنَادِيهِ بِنِدَاءِ أَوْلِيَاءِ الَّذِينَ وَجَدُوا تَاجَ هِدَايَتِ وَذَاقُوا حَلَاوَةَ مَعْرِفَتِ You call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at this stage with the call of his awliya, those who found the crown of guidance, those who tasted the sweetness of his ma'rifah, those who feared for themselves that they would lose this station that they have been brought to. So this makes, makes you humble in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if someone becomes deceived at that stage, and believes that they are now, they've become a wali, nothing can harm them, nothing can touch them, nothing can bring them down from that stage. Then that is also a way of this being, being deceived and becoming proud. So remember to remain humble at this point. That Allah, the same way He's given you all of these blessings, He can take them away at any time. So don't then, the sign of becoming arrogant is then to look down upon others, other Muslims who are not at that stage. As a dua in the Quran that is sums up this stage, O oh Allah, do not cause our hearts to go astray after you have guided us. And give us from your presence a great mercy. You are the one who is always giving. Okay, so... Um, Imam Ghazali said, even mentions, look even <coughs> the dua that we make in Surat Al-Fatiha. Ihdina Surat Al-Mustaqeem. This is the very same thing, you know, keep us upon the straight path. Keep us upon the straight path. Once we're there, then our concern should be always to thank Allah, praise Allah. Always remember how easily we can be taken away from these great blessings that Allah has given us. And to thank Him, to ask Him to keep us upon that path. So we say every day in our prayers, Ahdina Surat Al-Mustaqeem. He said, he said, mentioned that the philosophers, they looked and they said that all of the tribulations in the world can be reduced down to five categories. All tribulations in the world can be reduced down to five categories. al marad fil ghurba Sickness in a strange place. I don't know if they've translated it like that. But Sickness during the absence from home. Yeah, so far away from home. Al Fakr fi Shayb. Being very poor in your old age. So you become dependent on other people. Al Maud fi Shabab. Death in young youth. Wal Amma ba'd al Basr. Blindness after sight. Wal Nakira ba'd al Marifa. Having ignorance after knowledge. This is the one he's focusing on, the final one. That this is a great, great tribulation after ma'rifah, after having knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the oneness of Allah, to then fall into disbelief. May Allah protect us. The poet said, For everything, if you leave it or divorce it, there is a, a substitute except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you leave Allah, there is no substitute. So this is the type of thing that Imam Ghazali is talking about at this stage. Um, I'll read the next passage. وَكَذَلِكَ فِي كُلِّ نَعْمٍ أَنْأَمَ اللَّهُ بِهَا عَلِيكَ وَتَأْيِيدٍ أَيَّدَكَ بِهِ فِي قَطْعِ عَقَبَةٍ مِنْ الْأَقَبَاتِ 
ليثبت عليك ما أعطى ويزيدك فوق ما ترد وتود وتمنى فإذا فعلت ذلك كنت قد خلفت هذه العقبات الخطيرة العقبات الخطيرة وكنت قد ظفرت بالكنزين الكريمين العزيزين الذين هما الاستقامة والاستزادة إمام غزالي سيقول so now <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has helped you and guided you and given you tawfiq and brought you through this different stage. And now you're established through the seventh the seventh difficulty, which is to establish of a shukr. He says, now you have come to the two great blessings, the two great treasures. The two great treasures, which are al istikhama wal istizada having istiqama, uh, steadfastness, while istizada, always being in increase. And so as um, some of the shuyukh, one of the sayings of the shuyukh, al-karamatu wal istiqama, the true karama is istiqama, that when someone remains steadfast upon that path. It's easy in a way to struggle and strive and come to that level, but then to, to remain steadfast you know, for years and years and years of your life that is going ahead. That, you know, you come back after 10 years, the person is still steadfast on the path. You come back after 20 years, he's still on that path. You come back after 30 years, he's still on that same path. He's still on that same practice. That's true, Ibadah. That's true istiqamah. You know. Steadfastness. Well, at the same time, you have this desire, though, if you are truly, if you have truly purified yourself and you're in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the istiqamah, you will always have this desire, you will always be increasing as well. You will always be increasing. As long as you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will always increase you. So he says, at that point, Kuntahina idin min al arifin al ulama biddin. You will be counted amongst the arifin, the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the people of knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will be counted upon the ulama biddin, the true scholars. The true scholars are not those of the outward knowledge, but the people of true knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ata'ibin al tahirin. People who make tawbah always, people are always purified. A zahideen fi dunya, abstinent from the worldly pleasures. Al mutajaridin lil khidmah, always in the khidmah, always free to serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always free to serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because to serve Allah means to serve the deen of Allah. But you can't serve Allah, we can't actually give Him anything. We can't directly serve him. He doesn't need anything. So we should serve his deen, to establish his deen, to work for his deen, to work to spread his deen, to work to establish his ahkam, his rulings upon this world. That's what it means to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what he's made the work of the deen. That's why all the prophets do that work. If there was any other thing that was to worship or to serve Allah, the prophets would have done that work. What do the prophets do? They do da'wah and they do jihad. That's their work. So that's what it means to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, you will come to that, you will be one of those people that will be doing this. Al-Qahirin al shaytan someone who is control of shaitan. Al-Muttaqeen haqqat taqwa bil qalbi wal arkan. People of true taqwa. Sorry, Faisal, you come to the last stage. <laughs> So you, you're going to get to, you know, you come, inshallah, may Allah make you someone who goes straight to the top stage as well. So this is, you know, coming after coming through the seven stages. We've just been, we've been studying this book for a year. So this is the last darf, alhamdulillah. We're going to finish the book today, inshallah. Ta'ala. So that's why Imam Al-Zali is now talking about those people who have gone through this purification. Okay.
And we normally put the food back here. So the water more important to the control can القاصرين للأبل الناس هنا الخاشعين المتوادئين you become people who have now have don't have long hopes in this worldly life people who are people of nasiha people who are people of khashu' mutawadi humble المتوكلين المفوضين you people who are trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relegating all of your affairs back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Aradin al-Sabirin, you people who are now pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pleased with the decree of Allah, because that's what it means to be pleased with Allah, it means pleased with the decree, whatever He decrees, you're pleased with. As-Sabirin, people of sabr. And of course, the fasting we're doing now is teaching us sabr. Al-Khaifin al people who are always in a state of fear and hope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Mukhlisin al-Zakirin al minna People who have now come into a state of ikhlas, sincerity in their actions. Remembering always the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how he's guided them to that point. Always in gratitude for all of these blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them to give them tawfiq to come to this place. From there then you will go, inshallah may Allah make us all amongst them, to become amongst the mustaqimin, the people who are steadfast upon this path. You come back after 40 years, they're still in the same practice. They haven't changed from that practice. That's istiqamah. You can't judge someone from 5 years or 4 years or 10 years. No, 40 years, you come back, you see them. That's why you see those people of that age who have the nur, they have the nur in their faces. That's why it's one of the few things, you know, a few professions you can have. If you're a sheikh, the older you get, the more people will come to you. Yeah. The older the sheikh is, the more people will, the more nur is in that person. The more people will come to them for their barakah because they spend years and years and years and more time in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So think deeply upon these words. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives tawfiq. Sorry, also once again I'm rushing slightly today because obviously we want to finish inshallah in time. <coughs> we live unfortunately, we live in a in a in a dominant culture which doesn't respect elders. Huh? I think if you look historically as well, you'll find this one of the few civilizations which have such bad respect for their elders. You know, if you look at all traditional societies and traditional uh, uh, communities, how they used to honor their elders, not, if, if, if not regardless of Islam or not Islam, when people were elders, they were regarded as people that would be honored, they would make decisions, within the community, etc. This is one of the few that, you know, older, older people in this society are hidden away, not thought about, not mentioned, you know. It's a youth culture. And I don't want to get into a sidetrack, but this is, uh, links up to my theory about the, the Viking basis of this uh, civilization. Because if you look at the Vikings, they came with that, you know, they had that thing that the young, when they grew up, they would they would throw out the uh, elders because it was all about just physical. For them, they were like, just like, uh, you know, survival of the fittest type of, they were living literally the level of animals, you know. When the older person becomes too weak, he just gets thrown out and the young, strong take over. It's a terrible, horrible state. That's how animals live, you know. It's not human beings.
And then uh, Mamal Ghazali goes on to talk about how he said if someone asked the question, you know, looking at all of this, what we've done throughout the whole seven stages, throughout the whole year we've been studying this book. If someone were to say, look, this, what you've described is too difficult. This path is so difficult. All these stages we have to go through, all these difficulties, all of these challenges, you know. How can we do this? How, how is it possible? If that kind of Amr Kadharik, only very few people are ever going to get to this seventh stage that you're talking about. Imam al Ghazali responds, he says, Yes, I'm not denying that. And in fact, he mentions from the Quran, min ibadi ash-shakur. Very few of my slaves are grateful. The Quran says, Few of my slaves are grateful. I mean, Ibadi from my slaves are grateful, have got proper shukr, have proper on this seventh stage. It says in the Quran, most people, the majority of people, do not thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember, shukr is the opposite of kufr, remember. It says in different ayahs, the majority of people do not give shukr. Majority of people do not have aql, do not think, and the majority of people do not know. This is one of the proofs against democracy, by the way, which is to follow the majority. Another sidetrack I won't go into today. So, what was the last video said after shukran? There's three ayahs. Akhtharun uh, nas la Most majority of people do not give shukran. Majority of people do not think la yaqilun, and the majority of people do not know la yaqlamun. <coughs> so he says, yes, this is a difficult path. This is not many of human beings are going to get to this seventh stage. But he says, however, it is easy for the one that Allah wants to make it easy. And this is taken directly from hadith. While an abdi al-ishtihad, what is incumbent upon us is just to make the effort, the ishtihad, the effort. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِيْنَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا Those who struggle and strive in our path, we will definitely guide them to our paths. So what's upon us? Not to think, oh, this is too difficult, this is too hard, we're never going to get to the seventh stage or the sixth stage or the fifth stage. No, we make the effort. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy for us. And that's once again a trick of shaitan to make you give up. To make you give up, you know. You try to pray tahajjud for one year, you've never succeeded. At the end of the year you think, I better give up now. Yeah. That's the day shaitan will go and celebrate. So the, the point is, don't give up. Carry on trying. Carry on with the niya. Carry on with the intention. One day, inshallah, Allah will be with tawfiq. Don't give up because the niyyah itself is going to give you reward as well. If you went to sleep with the niyyah of waking up for his tahajjud, even if you didn't wake up, you'll have the reward for that. So Imam al says, وَلَا عُمْرِ إِنَّ هَذِي الْعَقَبَةِ طَوِيلَ He says, these stages are long stages. وَالشَّرَائِتْ فِيهَا شَدِيدًا These, the, the conditions, the prerequisites, the, the, the problems you'll face are difficult. But if Allah has chosen you, He will make the, the long path short. He will make the difficult easy for you. And the end of it, you will say how easy the journey was. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen you. And ultimately, this is the point, actually one of the points he's making in this last chapter, is if Allah chooses you, then you will be chosen and it will be easy for you. None of us know if we've been chosen or not. We just have to make the steps. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will choose us to be one of those people. He, says, uh, he gives an example of the Ashabul Kahf, the people of the cave. 
So, so he's giving now examples of how Allah can make the path very easy for people as well. Yeah? After establishing this a very difficult path, he said how Allah can make things easy for people. Look at the people of the cave. He says they were guided to the highest level in just a few moments. Why? Because when the king, you know who the tyrant king, who in, in, in among the guys says his name was Diqyanus. Well, we don't know, but that's possible. Diqyanus, one of these ancient kings, they stood up in front of him and they said, Rabbuna Rabbu Samawati wal Ard, bin They stood up in the face of this tyrant and in face of his armies and they said to him, our Lord is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. We do not call upon any other God. So he says at this point they were they were taken from, from the lowest to the highest levels immediately. Hasulat Lahum al Ma'rifa. They got to the level of Ma'rifa straight away. Why? Because then Allah saved them through karama. You know, they came to the level of having karamat. So immediately they went to the state of tafweed and tawakkul and istiqamah. Go to the cave. Allah will give you from His mercy. So also think about the, the magicians of Fir'aun, he says. Think about the magicians of Fir'aun. How they were transported in a moment from Kufr into the highest level of Iman as well. You know? Immediately when they went fall into Sajda, what did they say? Amanna bi Rabbil Alameen, Rabbi Musa wa Harun, we believe in Allah. So that was Iman, but immediately what happened after that? Firaun said to them, I'm going to cut off your hands and your feet. They said, we don't care, we trust in Allah. So they'd gone already straight away to the highest level of Tawakkul. Yeah. In the face of that huge tyrant, they said, we don't care. We, we trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how Allah can take people even in a moment if he wants to, to the highest levels of ma'rifah and tawakkul. So this is now Muhammad al-Zali is trying to give us hope. Saying, yes, the path is difficult, but don't feel that it's too difficult. Because if Allah wills, he can guide you easily through the path to him. It's also said, it's mentioned that Ibrahim ibn Adham, one of the famous Sufis of the early times, uh, you remember he was the one famous because he, he was a prince and he left, left all of his kingdom to go in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and live abstinent from the world. He's famous for that. It is said about him that his whole salute, his whole path, spiritual path, took place between Balkh and Marwa. Between Balkh and Marwa. The two cities. Yeah. Just between that, that one place to the next, he had gone from the to the highest levels of Ma'rifa, of Gnosis of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he mentioned several other as well. <coughs> Rabi al Basriya. Rabi al one of the famous Sufi women from obviously from Basra. It is said that she was actually a slave girl who was getting quite advanced in age and no one wanted to purchase her from the, the marketplace. And then one uh, person felt sorry for her and he actually purchased her and freed her, set her free. For 100 dirhams, which was not much price for a slave girl. So she then, after being set free, she, she took the path of spiritual purification. And it said within one year, she had reached such a high status of purification that the all of the pious men and the scholars of Basra were coming to visit her, to gain from her piety and her dua and her knowledge.
وعما الذين لم تسبق له العناية ولم يعامل بالفضل فيوكل نفسه فربما يبقى في شعبة من عقبة واحدة سبعين سنة لا يقطعها الإمام الغزائي says as for this is the other side now as for the one that Allah hasn't given his inaya as for the one that Allah doesn't guide and he is left to his own devices this person may be trapped on a particular stage from these seven stages we mentioned he may get trapped on a particular stage for 70 years and never get through it now people may people may spend their whole lives on that stage and never get through the stage of fighting against the tawakkul stage for example remember we did people becoming distracted and preoccupied with their business concerns, with their worldly concerns, with their rizq. They're unable to put that full tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and get through that stage. People may get stuck on the stage of the shahawat, the early stage. People may even be stuck on the stage of tawbah. They can't get through the stopping themselves from doing major sins and making tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People may get to further stages and get stuck on the stage of riyah. And they may never come through these stages if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't guide them. But the key is, because the person starts becoming dependent on himself. He starts attributing his success to himself. So then Allah says, well, okay, you, you believe you achieved this and you stay on your, on your own devices. So this is the key thing always to have humbleness in front of Allah. Thank Allah for the tawfiq, have shukr, and then Allah will increase you inshallah ta'ala. So this is all of it comes back to one thing, whatever Allah has decreed. Now then he asks an interesting question, Imam al-Ghazali in his style. He says if someone were to ask the question, why is it that some people are given this tawfiq? And why is it that others are not given this tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Both of them are trying to go on this spiritual path. Why is it that some are given a tawfiq and why is it that some get stuck in these obstacles along the way? Now, I love Imam al-Ghazali's answer to this and this just, just puts him in the place of the true alim, you know, the true alim that sorted out Islam for us, you know, sorted out the difference between aqidah, between fiqh, between uh, tawheed, between tasawwuf, because his answer is simple, he says, and the other swal to nada min surah the cat al jilal al jalal and al zimal adab. He says, at the point that this question is asked, and he is a beautiful, uh, very eloquent, very hard to translate into English, but he said, it is called out from the pavilions of majesty the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in other words a, a, a call comes from the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alzim al adab stick to the adab stick to your adab don't ask this question in other words this question is not for the human being to ask alzim al adab wa'ar of sirra rabubiya know that there is secret to Allah's decree and know that there's a secret to abudiyah to our slavehood we're slaves we're not for us to ask and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran La yus'alu amma yaf'al wa hum yus'alun. Allah is not asked about what he does but they are asked so this is the place where the aql of the human being has to do taslim in front of the greatness and majesty and the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we say, we believe in Allah and we believe there is whatever in His decree is from hikmah and from adal and from justice. But we don't arrogate ourselves to believe that our intellects can grasp the power, the might and the majesty and the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's one of the amazing things of Imam al-Ghazali that he knows where exactly 
what needs to be said at what point in these type of issues, you know. Now going on to the last section, we have I think about 15 minutes. In the last section he says, one of the points he's making is he says this part that we have described, this spiritual part, he said this is a part that is taken by the spirit, by the soul, by the qalb, by the heart. Which obviously you may think is pretty obvious but this is one of the things he's mentioning here. This is not a, when we talk about a long part we don't mean obviously a physical distance. Yeah, or a short part. This is talking metaphorically. This is a path that is taken by a uh, traverse by the spirit. Says Asluhu Nurun Samawiyun Wa Nazarun Ilahiyun. The foundation of this path is a heavenly light and a lordly glance. That strikes upon the heart of a slave. Because this is at the ultimate, the ultimately guidance is this nur that, that comes upon your heart from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no other way around it, you know. That's what Imam Ghazali says from Al Munkrim bin Abdullah. Ultimately, guidance is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, we can give people rational proofs. Yes, we can give people convincing proofs. Yes, there are convincing proofs out there, I believe. There are rational convincing proofs. Especially more, for, I, I believe, nowadays from scientific uh, discoveries at the forefront of physics and all sorts of uh, scientific stuff. But, ultimately, you can give people all of that, someone still may not believe. Ultimately, that, that belief is a nur, is a heavenly light that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cast upon whichever slave he decides, and we have to submit to the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's go to the last section now, where Imam al Ghazali finishes by an interesting something that might be quite nice to finish on as well. He, just, he finishes by saying <coughs> He says, you know, if someone said, look, this, this is so difficult, that part. What's the point of taking this part? You know, what's the actual point of going through all these hardships and these things? So that's well, the answer is simple. For two reasons. A salama to fit darain, well mulku fit darain. So that you can have peace and security in this life and the next, and, so that, you, and that you can have a huge, huge sovereignty of our own in this life and the next. These are the rewards that are promised for the people who take this path. So he says, ثُمَّ إِنِّي تَعَمَلْتُ مَا يُعْتِ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى الْعَبْدَ إِذَا أَتَعَى Imam al-Ghazali finishes the book by saying, I have reflected upon those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to the slave that worships him and purifies himself and goes upon this path. وَلِزِمَ خِدْمَةَ وَسَلَقَ هَذَا الْتَرِيقُ عُمَرَ A person who has sacrificed his whole life on this spiritual quest on this quest to come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what a great way to sacrifice your life. What a great, what a better way than to spend your life if not on this path. He says, I reflected deeply and I found that there are 40 things which are given to someone who takes this path. 40 things that Allah will give as a direct result of taking this spiritual path. 20 in this dunya and 20 in the Next world. 
Just to finish, actually, could I ask if Taimur or one of the brothers have a translation? We can actually just read, inshallah, the 40 things. Just just as a summary, maybe not all the details of them, but just, you know. Where is Do you want to do the 20 in the dunya and 20 in the akhir? Just sort of like the headings of them, you know. Um, point one of the gifts bestowed in this world, the first that is that Allah, glory be to him, remembers him and praises him. How great an honor for a servant that Allah, the Lord of all the worlds, should favor him with his remembrance and his praise. Number two, Allah, the magnificent in his majesty, thanks him and treats him. Uh, don't read the whole thing, but just, you know, like, if you can, just summarize the points, otherwise it might take too long. Allah thanks him and treats him with respect. Number three, he loves the servant. Number four, he becomes a trustee for the servant, managing all his affairs. Number five, he becomes for the servant a guarantor of sustenance. Number six, he becomes a defender for the servant. Number seven, he becomes an intimate friend for the servant. Number eight, the servant is blessed with personal esteem. Number nine, the servant is blessed with lofty aspiration. Number ten, the servant acquires richness of the heart. Number 11, the servant receives the light of the heart. Number 12, the servant enjoys expansiveness of the dress. Number 13, the servant acquires dignity and respect in people's hearts. Number 14, the servant enjoys loving affection in people's hearts. Number 15, the servant derives blessing from everything in general. 16, the servant has the earth at his disposal. 17. The servant has the animals at his disposal. 18. The servant has the keys of the earth in his possession. 19. The servant is endowed with leadership and prestige at the door of the Lord of mighty and might and glory. 20. The servant is guaranteed a response from Allah, exalted is he to his supplic supplication. So he never asks Allah for anything without his giving it to him and he never intercedes on anyone's behalf without his intercession being accepted. Pray on. First of all, Allah eases for the servant the agonies of death of which the hearts of the prophets salam, were afraid. So they asked Allah to make them easy for them. 22. Confirmation in true knowledge and faith, the prospect of losing which is a cause of all fear and alarm. 23. The delivery of spiritual comfort, a fragrant perfume and good tidings. 24. Everlasting life in the gardens of paradise, paradise and a proximity of the all-merciful. 25. There is splendor in the secret realm of the servant's spirit which ascends above the angels of the heavens and the earth in honor, grace and blessings. 26. Immunity from the torment of the inter interrogation in the grave and the instruction in how to answer correctly. 27. The winding and illumination of the grave so that the servant will be in one of the meadows of the garden. 28. The entertainment and honorable reception of the servant's spirit and its breath of life for it will be installed in the uh, abdomens of the green birds. 29. Resurrection in glory and honor, wearing fine garments. 30. Furnace of the face and its radiant light. 31. Security from the terrors of the day of resurrection. 32. Receiving the record with the right hand. 33, facilitation of the reckoning. 34, weighing in the balance. 35, delivery of the basin, the hope. 36, crossing the narrow bridge, the Sirat. 37, the intercession of the, on the field of the resurrection. 38, the estate of the eternity in the garden of paradise. 39, the greatest satisfaction. 40, meeting the Lord of all the worlds. <laughs> So they are the 40 things that Imam al-Ghazali says is given to people who take the spiritual path.
I'm going on right to the last section, last page now. Um, he finishes off by saying, "Thumma jumla tul amr wa tafsiluhu amma qalahu Rabbu al-Alamin fi arba ayat min min al-kitab al-Aziz." قال عز وجل أفحسبتم أنما خلقناكم عبثا وأنكم إلينا لا ترجعون. He says we can we can summarize everything into these four ayahs of Quran. Do you think that we have created you for no reason and that you would not return unto us? These very very deep uh, uh, ayah, you know, uh, for someone to really reflect upon. Do you, do you feel that you've been created for no reason? All of this creation is for no reason. Let each soul look for what he has sent forth for tomorrow. Have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is well aware of all that you do. Those who struggle and strive for our sake, we will surely guide them to our paths. So he summarizes everything from the whole book into these four ayahs of Quran. So just to finish off, it says, وَنَحْنُ نَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ مِنْ كُلِّ مَا زَلَّ بِهِ الْقَدَمِ أَوْ أَتْهَى بِهِ الْقَلَمِ وَنَسْتَغْفِرُهُ مِنْ أَقَاوِيلِنَا أَلَّتِي لَا تُوَافِقُ عَمَالَنَا we, are, we ask Allah to forgive us for all slips of the, the feet, all uh, slips of the pen. We ask Allah to forgive us from anything we say that does not correspond to our actions. We ask Allah to forgive us for anything that we have claimed or we have tried to show that we have any type of knowledge of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And recognizing our own deficiencies, we ask Allah to forgive us from any type of thing We ask Allah to forgive us from any type of thing that may have led us to 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 become pretentious or to uh, to show off in a certain way that is not truly us. In any book that we have written or any speech that we have spoken. Our ilmin afadnahu, or any knowledge that we have benefited from. We ask Allah to make us and all of you our brothers. We ask Allah to make us and all of you our brothers. We ask Allah to make us and all of you our brothers. We ask Allah to make us and all of you our brothers. To make us people who act upon what we know. We ask Allah to make us and all of you our brothers. And to make us those who seek His countenance. We ask Allah to make us and all of you our brothers. That He does not make the knowledge a tribulation against us. وَأَنْ يَضَعَهُ فِي مِزَانَ الصَّالِحَاتِ And that he puts our knowledge and our actions upon the scales of righteous deeds. إِذَا رُدَّتْ عَمَالُنَا إِلَيْنَا When our actions are returned back to us. إِنَّهُ جَوَّادٌ كَرِيمٌ He is the most generous and merciful. فَهَذَا مَا أَرَدْنَا أَنْ نَذْكُرَهُ فِي شَرْحِ كَيْفِيَةِ سَلُوكِ تَرِيقَ الْآخِرَةِ Imam Ghazali says, this is what we desire to mention in the explanation of how to take the part of the Akhirah We have fulfilled the intention May the blessings of Allah and mercy be upon the, 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 the best person who was born into this world and who called to the best one who is worshipped, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah have mercy upon him and his companions and his family. Tamma kitabu min hajil abideen, bihamdillahi ta'ala wa da'wati, husni tawfiqi. Alhamdulillah, rabbillah, alameen. I would like to ask Sheikh Thaqib to make dua for the ending of the book and for the breaking of the fast. It's a blessing to have him in our company. Please make your way to the front and make dua. No, no, please. Well, come, please. We just finished the book after one year, so please it'll be a blessing if you make dua, inshallah. And all the brothers who are here from the beginning to the end, inshallah, Allah will take you through the whole seven stages of the purification. And for those who just came for the last dars, they'll take you straight to the end, inshallah. <laughs>
I think it's time to take a while and get up really fast. Yeah. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika wa tabarak asmuka wa ta'ala jadika wa jala sanaka wa la ilaha hayruk Allahumma laka alhamdan hamdan da'ima wa laka shukra shukra da'ima Allahumma laka alhamdan mil as-samawati wa mil al-arbi wa mil ma bainahuma wa mil ma shayta min shayta min ba'd Allahumma laka alhamd hatta tarda wa laka alhamd iza radit wa laka alhamd iza radita Allahumma ina nasta'inuka wa 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 nasta'inuka اللهم لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وأكرم على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا وخير تعبدنا وصندنا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم صلاة تنجينا بها من جميع الأحوال والآفات وتطيرنا بها من جميع الحاجات وتطاهرنا بها من جميع السيئات وترفعنا بها على درجات. وتبلغنا دقس الغايات من الخيرات في الحياة وبعد الممات من تعرف لي شيء قليل اللهم, اللهم وفقنا لما تحب وترضى وأصلح أهمالنا وأصلح أحوالنا وأصلح ما ظهر منا وما بطن إنك بنا راحم يا أرحم راحم أو الله we ask you by your beloved in most bounteous names that you grant us tawfiq in this blessed month and you grant us acceptance with you and with your beloved messenger صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم Allah, we ask you to bless all those that sit here, and especially the brothers and the teacher who went through this blessed text of Imam al-Ghazali that instructs us in ways to benefit ourselves and to draw closer to you. That may we be those that benefit from this knowledge in implementation and in, in, in a fulfillment in what this book instructs us to do. Oh Allah, we ask that you bless the author of this book with the highest levels of Jannah. Mm-hmm. You pardon him for any shortcomings that he may have had. Mm-hmm. And you make his grave a, gra- a grave from the gardens of paradise. Mm-hmm. Oh Allah, we ask you to bless all those that are here with good health. Mm-hmm. And with, a sh- with and bless them with good health and a high state of the Iman. Mm-hmm. And that you alleviate from us any difficulties and any trials and tribulations that we have in our lives. Mm-hmm. Oh Allah, our wrong actions do not harm you. Mm-hmm. And our good actions surely entertain your pleasure. We ask you to turn to us with your pleasure, Ya Allah, mm-hmm. and that you grant us forgiveness in these blessed days mm-hmm. and promise us a freedom from the hellfire. Mm-hmm. Oh Allah, we ask that you give all of our children that are here and make them from the noble and from the righteous. Mm-hmm. Oh Allah, that when they grow up, may they be beacons that carry this blessed religion mm-hmm. to the far corners of this land. Mm-hmm. Oh Allah, we ask you that you give us tawfiq in our affairs mm-hmm. and you make this Ramadan one that brings a great blessing for us mm-hmm. and that changes the weaknesses that we have for strengths mm-hmm. and that we overcome our shortcomings. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salam ala muslim alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Oh Allah, we ask you that you end upon that our life we end upon Iman and our final words be La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam with Surah Surah Al-Fatihah